Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. We have made it through another half of another great season. And I'm, I'm really excited for today because we have part two of how Ted Lasso explains leadership. If you didn't hear part one of that, where Paul and I in the season two post-match show talked about episodes one and two, go back and listen to that if you are a fan of Ted Lasso. If you aren't, I still think you should go back and listen to it and you should become a t- fan of Ted Lasso because it is a great show with a lot of great lessons. But first half of this season, we had some great episodes as well. As with the last time, we aren't going to necessarily go into those but just generally Paul what'd you think of the first half of season three once again put together a great series of interviews crossing a lot of different conversations and different just a lot of different things in there I mean we were just talking before we jumped on here just the different things that we're able to pull out of our different guests and some of it just great conversation and just diving deeper into how people are living life and how soccer just overlaps with so many things that I think even I don't really think much about until we get into other people's lives and, and how soccer really does over, overlap just about everything that that we're doing at times. And connecting those dots has been a lot of fun. Yeah, and even with you right now, how uh, soccer explains leadership in life, you know, with COVID and, and issues. And you were just telling me beforehand that you had to cancel a game this Saturday because the other team only had 10 players. And, you know, it's just life happens sometimes and we just have to adjust and deal and how has that been just generally I mean again this isn't necessarily what this episode's about but I know people are dealing with so many things with COVID pivoting life changes issues how has that been in the context of a division one soccer program as well as running a family and dealing with starting a new business and all this in the midst of COVID just what, what's that looking like it's been crazy. And, and even this weekend, this will come out, I'm sure, after the weekend for sure. But it, just throughout the season, the way that we've navigated approaching the weekend, you know, just the communication between coaches and making sure that we're not putting our players in harm's way when it comes to where our numbers are. My team has been there. A lot of teams that we've played have been there as far as they've got injuries or they've got COVID or lack of numbers has put their team in jeopardy of, of injury because of numbers or kids are having to return to play sooner than they normally would because you're trying to meet the numbers that you need to play a match. And when does that become too much, you know, for the health and safety and the wellness of your players? And that's, I think every weekend you're navigating that. And I think if anything, we've had a lot of great transparency between coaches just to navigate that where you are thinking about your team, obviously, but you're thinking about the players on the other side of the pitch. And, you know, so I think there's been some uniting through a lot of this, but also it, it just kind of puts your focus where it needs to be. And I think we've talked about that from early on, that if COVID has done anything, it's trimmed the fat in a lot of areas and really help you realize the things that are the most important when it comes to staff and team and and, and friends and family and really kind of gets you to the heart, heart of the matter. So it, it has not been anything that I would love to go through again, but I think that it, it has sharpened us in a lot of ways. So it's hard to say that it's been an awful thing to go through, although there's been some tragedy for sure. But I think you can take it and realize that we're going to get sharper. We're going to get better through a lot of these things. Absolutely. You know, as we're talking, I realized I forgot to mention the fact that I'm Phil Dark, the host of this show. With me is Paul Jobson, the co-host. He's the women's soccer coach at Baylor University, who, since we last talked, has been crowned the basketball national champion. You know, and at some point, uh, hopefully, there'll be the women's soccer national champion as well. So, you know, we'll see. So what was that party like? Oh, man, we just had the parade on Tuesday in, ta- in downtown Waco, and, man, it was so cool. I mean, we've done it before with our women's basketball team, and we're not – not that we haven't had national champions here on campus before. We've had tennis. We've had women's basketball. We've had acrobatic and tumbling. We've had – so we're used to national championships, but that was a really special one just in the, the 18 years that Scott Drew's been here and taking that team from kind of the death penalty to national champions and, and me personally knowing that staff and the people that have come through that program, just quality people. And you just couldn't be more excited for a program uh, than I am for Scott Drew and his family and you know his basketball family. Just great, great people, you know, great, great men of God and just really a cool, cool story. So it's been a lot of been a lot of fun. So we're all enjoying the national championship this week. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. Hopefully a little break from the craziness of COVID too. And but you know, before we get into this Ted Lasso conversation on episodes three and four, if you haven't watched those or if you don't remember them, you might want to go back and we're going to talk about 
about some of them. You might go back and refresh your memory on them. If nothing else, good, good, good laughs. Or maybe you wait till after so you can watch these leadership lessons after the fact and kind of do your own little post-mortem on these shows. But uh, for again, before we get into that, though, I want to re- remind you that you can join this conversation at a deeper level on the Facebook page that we have for How Soccer Explains Leadership. Connect with us online, too. Con- you know, Connect with me on an email, phil at howsoccerexplainsleadership.com. You can also go on to, whether it's Facebook or any of the other social media outlets, and, and connect with us via comments. I'd love to talk with you about people that you think would be good guests. Maybe you'd be a great guest. Just you know, conversations more about how we can go deeper in, in our leadership through this beautiful game. Also, if you have any desire to go deeper with me on DISC personality stuff or other leadership principles with your clubs, with your teams, love to talk with you about that as well. So you know how to get a hold of us and go ahead and do that. You can look in the show notes if you forget or you didn't, didn't get that, catch it. You can also rewind. But now we are going to jump into this fun conversation. Actually, one more thing before we get back into that. I want to do, re- I do want to remind you, if you haven't listened, Phil Brown, he talked about how his adventure courses and the training he does in adventure sports relates to what we're talking about, relates to leadership as well. We had Glenn Crooks, who is a broadcaster. He also was the coach of Rutgers for years and years. Claim to fame, he coached Carly Lloyd. He's got a lot more claim to fame than that, but that's what he told me, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Actually, I think that's probably one of the lesser things in his career, if you look back at some of the lot. amazing the things that lot. he has done. I thought it was funny, though, but it shows kind of man he is that that's what he said his claim to fame was. But uh, he's also the voice of a New York City FC, part of the City Group. That was a really fun conversation. We talk to a referee. And what's cool about that, you know, again, this is multidiscipline stuff here. He wasn't even a soccer referee, field hockey, soccer, a softball umpire and basketball referee. Great conversation about angle perspective, you know, not, not compounding mistakes, talking about respecting authority, all kinds of cool. And we talked about VAR and, you know, if it's up to me, we scrap the thing. But uh, we talked about that. You can hear what, uh, what Dell thought about that in that Dell Jones interview. And then Max Rook, who is the Pepperdine assistant coach, who also is a leadership coach. Some great conversation there, too. So go back and listen to those. But again, we're not going to go deep into those because we are talking about, we'll start with episode three of Ted Lasso. We'll get into episode four a little bit later. But the first thing I want to kick off this this episode or this this conversation with is this conversation that that Ted had in his coach's room with Roy Kent and Coach Beard. And uh, basically what this is about is, if you remember in the show, Jamie Tart's buddies, they were making fun of and kind of bullying Nate the Great, you know, which, you know, as we find out later in the show, you don't want to bully Nate the Great. But, but they were, right? And so Roy's getting mad about it. He goes and talks to, to Ted about it. And, and, and Roy's like, Ted, what are you going to do? He goes, nothing. He's like, what do you mean? He says, well, Roy, I learned two pretty big lessons on the rough and tumble playgrounds of Brook Ridge Elementary School. One, if little Ronnie Fouch offers you a candy bar, you immediately say no and you get the hell out of there. Because there's a good chance that little son of a gun has just pooped inside of a Butterfinger wrapper. No one ever saw him do it, but a pe- couple people ate it. Number two, if the teacher tells, you bully, tells the bully not to pick on someone, it's just going to make it worse. So Roy said, so you're not going to do anything? And Ted said, nope. So... Beard then says, why are you winding up? Ted says, he's the one. If we're going to make an impact here, the first domino that needs to fall is right inside that man's heart. So that interchange, I wanted to go through it, first of all, because I thought it was pretty funny. I didn't nail it nearly as well as Ted. But if you've seen the show, you can imagine Sadukas saying it a lot better. It's why he makes millions of money doing comedy, and I don't. But what would you think, Paul? Yeah, I mean, it's a great scene. Uh, I think, thought your rendition was fantastic, Phil. Give yourself some credit there, man. But but yeah, I, I think that when when he goes into that office, you're not sure exactly what how Ted's going to approach that. But I think he handles it beautifully because we've said this before, whether it's been on in our clubhouse conversations or on this podcast, that Ted is who he is, who he is, and he's he's doing things in the short term that are going to be help him be successful in the long run. He's not looking for short term gains because the easy thing would have been for him to run into that fire, try to put it out himself. But as he knew, if the one in authority goes and addresses that with a bully, it's probably going to make it worse. Mm-hmm. And so his ability to identify the best way to get to his team 
in the locker room is great. And he realizes it, is if that situation can kind of take care of itself inside the locker room, they're going to be able to have a lot more success within the locker room. I mean, I, I say to our players all the time, I love you guys and I'm, I'm here to help and facilitate, but you guys live, eat, breathe together. I'm kind of an outsider when it comes to the locker room. And if it can be, if it can be controlled inside, the longevity of those decisions is going to be much greater than if I step into a situation. So uh, I love that from a coaching perspective and leadership perspective that there's certain things that as a leader you have to handle, but if things can be handled kind of on the inside, so to speak, that's the best way for it to, to be handled. And and it may not, it may be bumpy, right? I mean, it was bumpy. It yeah. wasn't uh, wasn't like he just walked in there and addressed it and everything was fine. But I love that scene and obviously the, the humor of it made it more fun, but it's realistic, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I talk about it all the time, right? I mean, and there's a great book too. I don't know if you've read it. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind and it's by Jonathan Haidt. If you haven't read it, folks, fantastic book, but it goes to this, this principle, right? This idea of what he talks about and there's a few different things, but one of them was this idea of now safetyism in our world, whereas parents, it's like, don't go to the park, kids, because you might get kidnapped. You might get hurt. You might get this. You might get that rather than I don't know about you, Paul, but when I was a kid, I was just like, Mom, I'm going to ride my bike. She's like, and she didn't even ask where. I just said, we're going to ride bikes. Right? We went. And we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have stuff. We'd go to the park with friends. We'd get into you know, a, a fight or we'd get into an argument. We had to deal with it. Right? We had to come up with an, a solution. I mean, I, I got in fist fights with people, and that night we were hanging out. Right? I didn't do that very often. Maybe once. I could. Okay, I did it once. But... I still did it. I can I can wear that badge, right? But uh, I wasn't, I, I, you know, if you've listened enough, you know that I, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But let's just, let's just be honest. But there were a few. But that's the point, right? Like we could have these arguments. We could work through them. We could deal with them rather than today where it's like they don't go to the park. And he says what that leads to is you don't know how to deal with conflict. You don't know how to do time management. You don't know how to, you know, just deal with these issues that come up in life, right? Because... We're getting where there's an argument. It's like, Mom, Billy's calling me a name. And then the kid's mom goes and talks to Billy's mom. What's going on? And they, they work it out, right? And so that's kind of that point here. But also the leadership that he knows that Roy needs to be the leader of that locker room. Now, whether it's Roy or somebody else, as a coach, we know as coaches there are those people that if we say if they get it, the team will get it. Because people want to follow that guy. But they got to get it first, right? You got to understand self before you can lead and before you can be that true leader of others. Have you seen that play out? I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but from that leadership perspective, from that one or maybe two or three people, that if they get it, as he said, that domino that needs to fall is right inside that man's heart. Like if they get it, but they didn't necessarily get it at first. Have you ever had that? Yeah, I mean, I think even within our program, you know, we've been here, 13 years and the ebb and flow of, of players as they, you know, filter in and filter out your leadership changes from year to year for the most part. And if, if the leadership isn't changing from year to year, the people that are following change from year to year. So there's a lot of turnover in, in, in where, where we are. And so there is an ebb and flow of, I don't want to say ebb and flow of commitment, but there is an ebb and flow of how things are, are dictated in the locker room. You know, I mean, my my standards haven't changed as a coach. The way that I approach things hasn't really changed a whole lot as far as what our core values are as a program. But I do think that how it's communicated in the locker room changes from year to year. So you do see an ebb and flow of commitment to certain things. Like, for example, let's just take fitness standards. And we've changed our fitness testing in different years just based on science and things that people are saying need to be done. But the buy-in there is different from year to year. And your leadership, we've seen the sooner the leadership buys into what you're doing, the sooner the rest of the team kind of comes along. Because what, what you can also see is, is what's considered a loud minority within your program, where you've got the folks who maybe aren't on board, you find out they're really loud about what they think, but there's really only a few of them. And then when you really kind of you start to dissect it, you realize like, man, like there's really only a couple of people who aren't on board with this, but they're really loud. Yeah. So you've got your quiet majority that you're like, man, you guys have got to speak up because this is important to most of you for being drowned out by a couple of people. So yeah, you see that ebb and flow in different things, but like Ted did, you identify that person that, that gets it and that can communicate it and does. I mean, he had the majority of the locker room. There's only one guy he really didn't have. And, and of course, he had a couple of little followers, but they turned very quickly when push came to shove. So that was a fun dynamic to watch because I think you do see that in 
I've seen that in my own locker room, not to that extreme, uh, you know, yeah, the old guys, the, you know, the bravado and all that stuff. But uh, you do see a little bit of that. Well, of course, it's hyperbole. And I, I don't think it was push came to shove. I think it was headbutt came to headbutt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's all right. I've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, so so I think that that's one thing we could talk more about that. But I think we'll move on to the next thing because we do have two episodes of Ted Lasso to get through. The other is that we'll get to this this idea of Ted gave all these players a book, right? Now, that spoke volumes on different levels, right? So it showed, one, he wanted them to learn, which is a huge part of it. But also, each book was different. It's not like he gave them all the same book, right? So Jamie Tart, I don't remember the book that he got. It's easier to remember the one that Roy got because it was talked about a lot more. But Jamie got the book called The Beautiful and the Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So if you've seen the show, you know why he gave him that book. But then he gave the book to Roy, and it goes to the same idea. This He gave Roy the, A Wrinkle in Time. And if you remember A Wrinkle in Time, it had a reluctant leader, had Meg. She's a reluctant leader. Great book. And uh, it's a kid's book, but, you know, as we saw in the show, adults can learn from it too. If you watched it, you see that Roy went through it, read it. And as, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. You know it by now. We already have spoilers. So this is an official spoiler alert that came after some spoiled things. But this reluctant leader idea. So what do you think about that? Because this goes to personalities too. This goes to a lot of different things. This goes to understanding your players, things we've talked about on the show over and over. And I think this is a great practical example. So I, d- I don't necessarily want to just focus on the books and whatnot, but what are some of those practical things we can do as coaches to be able to come into each player individually while not, cont- you know, you can't take the time every day to pour into them individually at that level but how can we study our players help our players to develop individually in the context of the team you mean just the individual leadership just on that principle that everybody has influence how are you pointing at each person to find their leadership through those things yeah like and how can, you, yeah, how can you help to, them right how can what did he do through that right so to just talk a little bit about that but then more just the idea of you know how can we help to develop each individual player to help them to flourish, right? How are we cultivating that environment to help all of our players to flourish? Well, we've talked about this a lot on on the podcast and different things as as you've got, first, you've got to know yourself as a leader, right? Then you've got to know your your players. And the only way to really get to know your players is by having conversation, I think. And whether it's, you know, in the office or it's, it's on the pitch, in a training session, you know, I have an assistant. The way he gets to know the players is through individual training. That's where they connect. When for me, it might be more, you know, in the office or after a training session. But if you don't really get to know your players and what makes them tick, I don't think you can really pour into them what it is that they need to maximize their influence on the mm-hmm. team. And I think because it's television, Ted was able to yeah. identify personalities very quickly to figure right. out which books uh, to give people. But I thought that was an interesting concept for sure to give those those different books to different people but just shows you know his intentionality and what he felt was important but i think just intentionality pouring into each person individually to pull out what it is that gives them the most influence and we talk about even within our our leaders you know i think you know we had a senior group dinner last night and one of the things we talked through was like hey tell tell us something that you value about someone else in this room. So it's our, our seniors. Hey, one senior, you you talk about another senior and talk about the things that that you value about them as a person. And a lot of times that ends up being what their influence is uh, on the team. And so even having your team pull out and identify places that people have influence is important because I think it's hard to identify for yourself sometimes what those things are. So sometimes you need people to speak into you. So those are some things that we've done to help do that. But I do think getting to know each person's personality is is really important. What makes them tick? What what fires them up? Yeah, you know, it's not like just stepping on the pitch fires everybody up. It does to an extent, but what is it within those circumstances that I've got a couple of girls? They love being organizers. They want to organize mm-hmm. the team dinners. They want to organize the coffee talks. They want to organize the Bible studies. Um, and I got others that are like, I don't want anything to do with organizing. Yep. You know, uh, there's other things that I want to do. So getting to know those personalities, I think, has been been really important. And that's something that it's like Ted 
Ted has been able to do very quickly. Yeah, obviously. He like, read the scripts. Yeah. You know, he read the script. Exactly. He knew whatever his personality was. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, with, with TV, it fast forwards the process. But I think, like you said, and there are other things that can fast forward the process. I mean, as we talked about, you know, doing disc assessments, having people be able to understand the personalities. But you got to understand what disc is and how it works. And, and then you need to understand yourself and you need to understand others. So there's, there is work that goes into it. But what I loved about it was, yeah, it's not just the same book. It's intentionality of this is what you need at this moment to be able to help to develop who you are, right? And that can be done a lot of different ways, but I think it's that the point is that intentionality. And I think the other thing that, that it showed in there was you can't make anyone do anything. Now, there's consequences for not doing it, but Jamie took the book, tossed it in the trash. It said a lot about his teachability, his coachability. It said a lot about what was his, you know, how can you get to him? It may not be as simple. Some people, yeah, you give them a book, they'll read it. Other people, you give them a book, they'll either pretend to read it, they won't read it, or they'll throw it in the trash, or they'll intend to read it and not because they, whatever, right? But how do you follow up? How are you able to have those conversations? You don't just give them the book and say, go. But... I think the best part that I liked about it, it wasn't a book that said, this is going to just reinforce what you already think. It was books that address blind spots. And so I think that's something as coaches, as leaders of our people, as leaders of our families, to be able to help our children, help our employees, help our players, help our spouses see the blind spots so they can be sharpening who they are and they can be flourishing at that highest level because for the people we love and the people we care about and the people we're leading we want them to be able to see their blind spots not so they can you know not work on strengths and not do all that I mean I'm I'm a big fan of strength-based leadership as well but I also know that if we don't know our blind spots at the very least we're not able to flourish at the highest level within our strengths so any thoughts on that before we move on to the next thing yeah, I think those things are, are really important. I think sometimes the reason that our group yesterday spent so much time pouring into each other and what the positives were is because I think because of COVID and, and there's been so much negativity lately that I think our our blind spots have been drawn out to a greater extent over the last year within our program. And so we've been trying to be very intentional on the other side of it to pull out, hey, here, here are a lot of the positives. So as we've learned on this podcast through one of our, our interviews uh, a few weeks ago that our brain, you know, 80% of the thoughts are, are negative thoughts. Right. We go there a lot and especially in times when times are tough, but finding those and identifying those blind spots is, is very important. You talk about children, you know, helping them navigate those things is so important. You know, as we're, I was talking with someone earlier this morning about just with COVID and just kind of the thing that everybody's been through, how important it is that we walk our children through this because they need to know how to to think through this, how to find their blind spots through this, how to grow through this, how to be spiritually stronger through this. So the partnerships and those things are very important, whether you're guiding your team, you're guiding your your business, or you're guiding your family. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that that's it's so again like you said it partnership I mean, it's really seeing that we are a team and if we're truly a team then we're going to care we're going to love we're going to want to be able to help them flourish we want to ha- and we're going to trust them to challenge us to be able to be the best we can be too it's as iron sharpens iron one man sharpens another right that that proverb has been used in so many things for good reason right? I mean, it is truth. It is something that, but it hurts. Iron sharpening iron is not a process that is easy and simple and doesn't have issues. No, it's banging together and it's actually forging that iron, that steel, that whatever it is, a sword, whatever it is. It doesn't just happen. There is friction. There are times where we need to come into that fray and be able to really pour into that and really deal with these issues. That's definitely something that, like I said, I mean, if you saw in the in the episode, Roy was, as he finished that book, he said a word that I'm not going to repeat on this podcast because it would go in the explicit category. But he realized it, right? And that, that was a, not a thing he wanted to do. It was friction. It caused that uncomfortable part, as we've talked about on the show, most of the great things in life come on just the other side of comfortable. 
And so he was getting out of that comfort zone and realizing, no, I need to be this next person, which turned out to be, as we look in the show, that next phase of life, he's going to need a lot of those things. So if we truly are developing human beings and not just players for a soccer team, then then that's something that should be important to us. Yeah, I think you touched on something there, Phil, that I don't want just to, to float over, but I think it's so important that no matter what the situation is, whether it's a difficult situation, mainly the difficult situations for sure, because those are the ones that stand out the most. But, you know, I fully believe that God puts you in situations that it may not be something that he's teaching you for the right now, but if you don't go through it right now, you won't be what you need to be for whatever it is that's coming next. Mm -hmm. So I think through all the, the, the struggles that so many people have gone through during this COVID season, I mean, God's preparing us for what's next so that we can be more resilient or whatever it is. Everybody's situation is different, sure. but I think if we try to skip through it and get past it or cover it with something or pretend it doesn't happen or whatever, I think we miss an opportunity to grow and develop to be what God wants us to be, especially in whatever that you mentioned, the next phase of life for, for Roy, you know, I'd see that with my players like, Hey, there's some difficult things we're going to go through here while you're in college, but you're in a safe zone to go through those things and safe area to fail where when you get out of here and real life hits you, you're going to be more prepared. Yeah. So I didn't want to just brush over what you say. I think it's so important, Phil, what you said there about, hey, it's preparing for what's next, uh, the next phase, if whatever whatever that thing is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad that you, you reiterated it because, yeah, if there's one thing we want to make sure we're talking about here, it's that. It's that we are, it's more than, it is more than soccer. You talked about some of the different past episodes. It made me think of when I was talking with Eric Pfeiffer on emotional intelligence and James 1, right, 2 through 5, where it talks about consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. That's not something the world teaches you. That's not something that we normally say is, oh, yeah, consider it pure joy when you're suffering, when you're going through these issues, when you have problems. But when you can see that other side, when you have that eternal perspective, when you have a perspective that is much greater than just this game or this day or this week or this year, and we can look beyond it and go, okay, COVID happened. What, what were we able to do? How did COVID grow us? How did these lockdowns grow us? How did this common testing, how did not being able to have a, a game and dealing with that disappointment, how is that making us stronger for the future? I mean, I just complained before this call and I didn't do what I just talked about where I'm like, we just found out we have to do testing for the high school this year. And, and it's just like, man, what a, what a pain in the butt, right? Which you're going, Phil, it's nothing. Come on, man. I've dealt with a lot worse than that. But, but still, these are little issues, blips on the radar but if we focus on them in the short term and we deal with them, I mean, we, we just like focus and focus and focus, then yeah, it could tear us up. It could put us into depression. It could put us in all these things. But if we have that that view of we are getting sharpened, we are getting formed and our character is being developed and our integrity is being shaped and formed, our identity is being formed, then we have a whole different perspective on it. Going back to perspective, as we talked about with that Adele Jones interview. So the next thing I want to get into is, is really this idea of having a humble and learning posture. So if there's one thing Ted Lasso has, it's, it's, it's a humble and learning posture in the context of, of soccer and the context of these other things that he's doing. So that, it comes into a few times in this episode, and, and one is during the interview with Trent Krim. Actually, right before the interview kind of starts, but right when Trent comes up and he sees the play on the field and he goes, where'd this play come from? And if, earlier in the episode... Ted had asked Nate the Great for some advice, and, and Nate gave it to him, and so they tried this. It always cracks me up when they have the set plays like throughout the, the field like, it, like we do that in soccer. But anyway, he, he tried a play of Nate's, and it worked, and Trent says, wait a sec, you got a advice on coaching from a kit man? And Ted said to Trent, he said, Nate has forgotten more about this game than I'll ever know, or something like that. But it's this idea of who would go to the kit man for strategic advice. And obviously, again, it's a little hyperbole, it's a little whatever, but that's such a great lesson from, uh, for us that we can learn really from anybody about life, about things that we can take. And if we truly have that posture of, no, tell me, what are your thoughts? I could learn something from it. And if not, well, we're building relationships. So that's a win. So what is, what do you think of that? How have you seen that in your life as far as that humble posture, that learning posture. We've talked about it on the show before too, but I think it comes into play so often throughout this this show. I think in this episode, it really, and, and you could see how Trent was just like, this makes no sense, right? This is such not the way of the, the world, especially the world of, of football. So what do you think? 
Yeah. And I think when you get to the end of it and Trent kind of writes a story, I mean, that's part of the story mm-hmm. is that I don't understand it, but it's just hard not to like the guy. Right. And I think in an organization, if you can recognize that, first of all, as a leader, you can't have your eyes on all things, but if you can trust the eyes of other people that are seeing things that you're not, you're going to go a lot further. I talked a minute ago about our players. You know, I'm not, I'm not in it with them. I'm not a player. I'm not, you know, hanging out with them away from the soccer field. We're not living life together, but their eyes are important in what they see. You know, my athletic trainer, it's important, you know, what she sees, my strength coach, what she sees, our dietitian, what, what he sees, my director of operations, what she sees, because we're all seeing things differently. And I think Nate, the great's perspective uh, is fantastic because, you know, you'll see it when later on in the season, when he gets to address the team, his perspective is spot on Mm -hmm. better than anything that, that Ted or Beard are going to be able to say, because Nate, the great has not only been in the locker room, he's kind of been a fly on the wall in the locker room. They don't even recognize he's in there when he's, you know, other than if they want to pick on him, but he's walking through, putting out uniforms and cleaning things. And he's hearing things that they don't think he hears. So that perspective, when there's a trust there, amongst two people where he can go to Ted and, and share thoughts. Ted being humble in those situations, understanding that how important that is, is going to help him be a better leader. So I don't think you can turn your eyes and ears off to other people in your organization without maybe spiraling out of control because you really don't, you can't have your pulse on, on, on everything, but I'd love to hear kind of your perspective in the organizations that, that you're running how that plays out. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's just, I know I can learn from anybody. You know, literally, I've done work all around the world, and I've talked to people in the slums of numerous countries. In fact, it was really cool yesterday, just yesterday, two days ago, I got a LinkedIn message from a friend of mine in Brazil from a trip I went on. It was a a lawyer to, back when I was a lawyer in my past life, it was a lawyer to lawyer ministry trip. I went down to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, and one of the attorneys that I had met during that trip reached out to me just out of the blue. He's like, hey, how you doing? Remember our trip? And he promised me, so Gilberto, if you're listening to this, I, I do mean it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back down there. I'm going to make good on that offer to go to the Santos match with you someday. So just be ready with that ticket. But that the point of that, it wasn't so much with him, but there were people in the slums, people in some of the ministries that I'm learning from them things to this day from that trip in 2005 I'm still using. There are other people, these kids that I'm learning from as I'm either watching them or I'm seeing them to talk about hope. I see, watch watch a three or four year old or five year old, I mean you see it regularly, but watch them enjoy life. The carefree, you know, you hear Jesus say, come to me with faith like a child, like a child, right? Watch them and learn from that. Like you could, we can learn so much from that about not letting the little things bother us. But at some point, you know, you hear about that. You, you do studies with kindergartners and they say, how many uses of a paper clip are there? And they have like 5,000 uses of a paper clip. Then you ask a high school senior how many uses of a paper clip and they come up with like three. And it's this idea of we are, it's interesting, the more we learn, it seems like the less we are creative, the less we can think outside the box, the less we can learn that that we don't know or that we don't want to know right so when we go with people from different perspective we go with people from different cultures we go with people from different views on life we go with different positions in our organization so you see the best organizations of the world that leadership books i've read the best companies 3m is a great example 3m gives each of their employees a set time every day to just dream about new products. You wonder how 3M got to be where they are. It's because their employees came up with the post-it, came up with other things that we use every day, and it wasn't just so, it was because they were like, I wish I had something to stick on my computer where I can look, or it probably wasn't a computer. It was like, a, like, I wish I could just stick it on my notebook so I can remember something later. Oh, well, I don't do that, right? And because... When we think about that, or they say, you know, the best time to learn and be creative is just going to walk because you clear your mind, right? So much more. I mean, we can spend five episodes talking about this and we will talk more with different people. I have no doubt about this topic, but you say, but how have I learned about it? Well, whether I'm a lawyer, again, as a lawyer, I've learned one thing as a lawyer. If I learned anything as a lawyer, I learned this one thing. If you don't know something, go get an expert witness. 
you can know just enough to know what you don't know, and then you go get somebody else who can help you learn. Right, So if you don't know something, yeah, you can go on Wikipedia, you can go on Google, you can go on whatever, but you don't know the credibility of that source. So you need to get to know people, you need to understand them, and then you need to be able to understand their heart, their views on things, their worldview. Are you on the same page? Then, okay, let's have conversations. Right. So I think that in our organizations, if we're not going to everybody, literally everybody in the organization, there was a silly soccer movie I watched. I don't even want to admit what it was, but it had a, if you've seen it, you know it. There's this janitor who was this guy who's just, you know, no one paid attention to, and he ended up being the coach of the team because he played in some South American country. I forget which one, but, and he played and he was a star and they found out that and he ended up coaching the team. But again, he would have been forgotten and he wouldn't have even been seen if you don't ask the question and you don't enter into that relationship to find out what might you know. Yeah, that's, that's great. Just being being open to conversation with anybody, whether they're the, the janitor or the, the CEO or whoever, there's people who have great perspectives. And I think, I think it's Andy Andrews does a great job of talking about, you know, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. When I was 20 something, they asked me, I knew everything. But now that I guess now he's probably in his 60s or 70s, like I realize how much I don't really know about the world right. and being open to, to hearing what people have to say. And I think that's something that, that Ted does a really good job on the show of listening to people around him to help navigate the ins and outs of running that team to make it to get the locker room where he needs it to be, to, to, be, to get the front office where he, he needs it to be, not knowing that everything is being pushed against him in that time, but doing a great job of, of listening to so many different people and in and, and doing that gets everybody, you know, spoiler alert, gets basically everybody on the on the same page moving right, forward. Right. And as Glenn Crooks talked about going back to the first episode of this half of this season, John Wooden quote, the best things we learn are the things we learn after we know everything. So yes. it's the same idea of that Andy Andrews quote. And that's why do we do this show. We have people that I mean who would have think that a dude who a referee of a field hockey, which I've never watched a field hockey game, I'm not gonna lie but he can come on and teach us about soccer leadership and stuff. A guy who teaches adventure sports, other people who have never coached a game, but they can teach coaches, they can teach leaders, they can people who haven't led a Fortune 500 company can teach a Fortune 500 exec. A soccer coach of a measly school in Waco, Texas can teach a CEO of these companies, right? Like that's the yeah. beauty of it. And so what were you going to say? Yeah, I mean my, my dad was a, a fantastic soccer coach, but he never played soccer in his life. Mm -hmm. you know, he played football, he ran track, but he was a leader. He knew how to get people around him to get done what needed to be done. And we had some great, it was youth soccer, but we had some great youth teams growing up. He was one of the first, and I'm not saying that because of my dad, Clint Mathis became who he was, but was one of Clint's first coaches. And he knew how to get people to do what what they to get the best out of people right. and it wasn't because he was a soccer coach it's because he was a leader uh, and he knew how to get the most out of people but he also knew what he didn't know and got people around him to do those things and i think by the end of his life people were like man your dad was an amazing soccer coach did he play i'm like no yeah my my mom introduced us to soccer at the ymca when we were <laughs> when my brother was like four you know my dad was like what is this foreign thing but <laughs> But because he knew what he didn't know, yeah. he stepped in to be something really pretty special. And of yeah. course, now that's trickled down to now his son is a, basically a professional soccer coach, mm -hmm. which is crazy. But because of his leadership and his his ability to get the best out of people, I think a lot of lives were changed from that perspective. So uh, a cool example just yeah. in my own life of somebody that knew what he didn't know, but knew what he did know and put those things together and was able to have some success on and off the field. Yeah, definitely. My dad, same story. I'm not going to rehash the entire story, but thanks, Dad. It's it's something now he didn't he doesn't have the I, I'm going to say it. Your dad was the reason Clint Mathis made the World Cup team. So um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if we had any World Cup players, but my dad, same story, played football, never played soccer, but he was great coach for many years for me. And we won a state cup. We won these different things. So it's like, again, because he was willing to learn. He knew people. He knew how to get the best out of people, which goes to the next thing. The next quote. Bill, wait, wait, though. Our dads, that generation, were the original Ted Lassos. They were. They were the original Ted Lassos. And you're in Texas. Of course, he was Kansas. Yeah. But still, like, that's, yeah, you're right. But if you think about it, that Absolutely. generation was a generation of people of that were like, hey, I don't know anything about this sport, yep. but I see the benefits of it. 
they took, you know, and, and have changed the next generation of soccer in our country, really. Yeah. Is it, but if you take that, it's like that. They were the original Ted Lasso's, you know. So thanks to our forefathers. Well, they they should get royalties on the show. I don't know. I'm good with that. I, I think I think we need to work on that. So that goes really. I mean, what a great segue. That wasn't even. Ten, we just this just happens, folks. Like you, you think we we script this thing, but the next quote. Uh, the next thing is when Trent basically talked to, to uh, Ted about, he goes, hey, did I hear right when I heard you guys had a party for uh, a player after you guys lost to Crystal Palace? And Ted says, yeah, I've never concerned myself much with wins and losses. And then later in the, in the episode, Ted said to him, he said, success isn't about wins and losses. It's about helping these young men be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. And we talk about this all the time. We don't need to belabor the point. But I just want to see if you have anything else to say on that point before we talk about. And then I just, you know, yes, talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about one more thing. And then we're going to go to episode four after you talk about this. But you got to talk about the Indian yeah. food, too, with Ollie. And yeah, uh, yeah. you just got to talk but, about but that. But I think I think quickly, I mean, you know this about me, but I feel like if you get those pieces right and it's it's about the people, then I think the wins take care of themselves. You get the right people in place. You do it the right way the wins take care of themselves. And we, we feel like that for us, developing young people is extremely important. Our vehicle is soccer, but if done correctly, uh, I think the wins will take care of themselves. I, you know, I fully agree that I can't say that I don't concern myself with wins and losses because too many losses, I won't be here. But sure. I think that is kind of something that's missed, especially at the professional level is that, you know, we've talked about how quick ownership groups are to change people out. We don't really need to rehash that probably, but if you are going to invest in people and it is about people, I think you need some time to be able to do that. And I do think the wins, the success on the field will take care of itself if, if done the right way. I agree. And I, I, I've said that many times that I, I do think that's kind of the dirty little secret of coaching in my, in my opinion is if you focus on the people and developing human beings, yeah, you need the talent of course, but at some level of talent, I think that the coaches that don't focus on the people will lose eventually. We've used Mourinho as an example of that. Look at Tottenham right now. I mean, it's it's the same thing over and over. And then I, I don't know his style. I don't know how he does it. But I was just hearing some guys talk about Zinedine Zidane and seeing what he's doing at Real Madrid quietly, mind you. He's not bringing a lot of focus and attention to himself. And at Real Madrid, that's, that's kind of hard. But the silence from that club has actually been you know, deafening really to wonder like what is going on there. And then all of a sudden they're in the semifinals of the champions league. And by the time this airs, they it may have another game with that, but they were talking about him saying he's one of the kindest, you know, I mean, notwithstanding the headbutt in the world cup, but we all know the kind guys, if, if, you know, that often get that even, even spirit. still dark got in a fight at one time I heard. So that is true. I heard that same thing. So, and so did everyone else earlier on. So, yeah, but I think that that's something that we, we, again, we talk about it all the time. If it's not, that's why this show exists. If it's not about helping the young men and women that are in our lives, seeing it as a privilege, seeing it as something that we get to train them up to be the best versions of themselves and it's not solely landing on us but if we're having this much time with men and women young girls and boys where it's two three nights a week and and saturdays and sundays potentially and just time with them that's more time than some parents get with the kids during the week so if we're not taking that seriously then i think we're missing the boat for sure. And I think getting you know deeper into Ted and just kind of his perspective on things, you know, it's not just about his soccer team. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at how he pours into the little girl in the street mm -hmm. playing soccer. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about the, the hot, spicy food. I mean, he's pouring into that dude who's serving the food at his dad's restaurant. And he is killing himself <laughs> eating that because he is trying to build up that he's not a kid. I mean, he's an adult yeah. who has a restaurant, you know, a restaurant with his dad, basically. But like he wants to to build people up, you know, and he's not doing it. It's not like the food was bad. It probably was really good. He just wasn't right. used to the heat. Um, I can appreciate that. But, I, I would not, I would have been Ted in the Indian restaurant. So I, I am not a spicy food guy. So I would have, yeah. been well, right I wouldn't have it. been Ted because I don't think I would have put it in my mouth. <laughs> he's true. a bad man. That's that's true. Him, that's you know, true. I would have crammed being like, do you know what we're doing here? But you know, I, I think that's just his personality. Right. And it, it, it goes back to things we've talked about on this show before. Is it like, 
you got to know who you are. You are who you are, no matter what the circumstances are. He's the same guy in the restaurant with Ted Krim as he is in the locker room with with Beard and 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 Roy and Jamie. Yeah, and for, I mean, that should be encouraging to all of us to again know who you are. To thy own self be true, but you need to know thine own self before you can be true to thine own self. And if you don't, you know that's Shakespeare for folks out there. If you aren't cultured like like Paul, that that's Shakespeare. I don't. I, I of course, as I say that, I, I don't. I'm, is that Macbeth? I forget. But anyway, so it's one of those one of those plays. If you know that and you t- and you email me with that, uh, I'll, I'll find a prize for you. But let's move on to episode four. Which goes to similar things where it's talking about these ideas of getting people together and helping people to flourish and, and they knowing that if you're in conflict and you're not able to work out and reconcile with others, that's only going to help and that's only going to make you weaker, make you somebody who's struggling with something as they say, what is it like if you, if you don't forgive someone, it's like taking poison and expecting the other person to, to die or something like that. Like this bitterness is eating you up. And it's not only breaking down the team, but it's taking away from who you can be, right? So, you know, they're fighting in the locker room, and it's one of my – I love it. He goes, he goes, hey, Beard, what's the number one rule of fight club? He says, no fight club. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then when they're fighting on the field, he goes, you know what I'm thinking? Beard says, yep, West Side Story. He goes, you got it, Sharks and the Jets. So, again, this is just culture day. We got Shakespeare. We got musicals. You know, so what more do you want? I mean, I'm trying here. I'm trying to, to help you out there – to get developed in your culture. But beyond that, so many good lessons from this. And if you go into that episode, and I'm going to kind of bring a lot of it together, and we can talk about it all at the same time because we are kind of late in this in this show. But this show, if you remember this episode, they go and they have the the benefit. And the, really, the, most of the episode is centered around, well, centered around a couple things. One is Rebecca finding her identity. But then also, as, as he said to the guys, he said, you don't need to be best friends to be great teammates. He's talking to Roy and Jamie in particular, these two guys who are leaders using different, you know, whether it's intentional or not, leadership is influence, and Jamie's influencing and Roy's influencing. And then the, the quote he said, I like my locker rooms like I like my mother's bathing suit. I only want to see that thing in one piece. So then as they go, and then Jamie, or Jamie and Roy end up at the bar reconciling as they do. It's not that they're best buddies, but they at least come to a, an agreement almost, like a, a mutual respect in some way. And then it goes on. So what, what did you think? I just want to hear your thoughts on that from a, from a whole and kind of a 30,000 foot view, so to speak on that episode, anything else that you want to pull out of it as we kind of bring this episode to a close? Well, I've, I've heard other people comment on kind of that idea of you don't have to be best friends, but you've got to be teammates and, and, you know, folks that aren't in the locker room all the time or don't run sports teams. That it's kind of an interesting concept, but for me, I feel like that's taken out of out of every locker room. Like I think probably every coach has said that at some point in their career. Like, hey, you don't have to be best friends, but you have to be teammates. Mm-hmm. And helping people navigate what that actually looks like is very important because I think, especially at at the youth level and probably the college level, especially in the in the women's game, I would say that they feel like they have to be best friends. And while we want everyone to get along and be friends, at the end of the day, when it comes to competition, they've just got to be teammates. And treating people with respect on the field and off the field, you're just being teammates. You know, we work together. We have a common goal that we're trying to attain. We have to be able to work together. We have to be coworkers. Um, but it doesn't mean we have to have coffee every morning together or eat dinner together or even talk off the field necessarily. But I do think that common respect is, is very important for them to be able to help the team accomplish their goals as a team. And I think that that kind of that scene at the bar with Jamie and Roy as they kind of worked through things during earlier on in that episode, it was important that you finally saw the walls break down a little bit. You know, the egos, well, their egos don't go away, right. but you know, there's <laughs> right. some cracks in the wall there where light comes through yes. and it's not just complete darkness. And they're able to communicate to the point where there's some commonality there where they can say, okay, maybe we can make this work, you know, and a lot of it came to the point where realizing Roy kind of admitting that he was a lot like Jamie when he was younger, yep. this, this, finding those commonalities between two people who maybe don't get along is usually the thing that kind of breaks that light through the darkness a little bit. Yep. You know, I, I think I've talked about it on this show, but I know I've talked about it on the think orphan podcast a lot. One of my mentors 
speaking of mentorship, because that's, I think, what, what happens on this show, too, is seeing Roy as that older player, seeing him himself as a mentor is what Roy is trying to get him, I mean, Ted's trying to get Roy to understand. But one of my mentors said to me, I was talking with him, and he does mediation in the Middle East. And I said to him, I said, how in the world, you know, you're talking about Sunni versus Shia Muslim, like, you're talking about Palestine's Jews, you're talking about, like, people that literally hate each other. And he's doing mediations with this. And, and I said, how, how, like what he goes, well, Phil, he goes, it's actually, it's quite simple. He says, we start with what we, what they agree on. We find what they agree on. And if we can figure out, okay, what do we agree on? We agree that we want to win. We agree that, you know, we're humans, (laughs) right? We agree that we, we have get as basic as we have to get. We have hopes, dreams, fears. We have loves. We have we have issues, we're broken, we have problems, we have this, we have that, right? So what do we agree on? And then you find out that most of the things we agree on, okay, then you can start dealing with the things you disagree on. And at the end of the day, like you don't have to walk away, kumbaya, this is amazing. No, you can just walk away going, okay, I'm not going to kill you, right? I'm not going to try to destroy you. And if you can get to that, like that's a good start because these guys were actually trying to tear each other down. As he said... Roy said to Jamie, he said, even though I know I should pass to you, you're so selfish and arrogant. Every time I do, it makes me want to puke. Anybody who's coached a team know there are people on the team that that's what other people feel about them. But if you're going to be a great team, that person who is creating that feeling in others needs to understand that he can't do that or she can't do that. And the other people need to understand that, you know what, you can't have that feeling either. I mean, you can't have a feeling, you can't act on it, right? Like you need to figure out how to get past that. You need to figure out how to address that person and be able to come to terms. And as we talked about in the show, if it becomes where it's such a virus that it's tearing down the team and it's a huge negativity that just won't go away, then yeah, you need to deal with that differently. But it's something that I think we... You know, he ended up bench, benching Jamie for a little bit in that episode, or not in the next episode, I think, or a couple away. And that's something that needs to happen sometimes, right? But anyway, any other thoughts on that before I go to one last point before we close up the show? No, let's hit that. Let's hit that last point. So the last point is celebrity status is man made and it's absurd. This is my Phil Dark deal here. And the reason I bring this up is you talk about Cam Cole at the end of this episode. Cam Cole is the troubadour who's in the, on the street playing music, right? And substance and talent and who you are and your identity should be what we're talking about with people. Who you are, what you're made of, you know, what is your identity? But instead we focus on name, whatever, you know, you look at American Idol, these are kids who are made fun of in classes and are hardly seen. They're like invisible kids on their campuses in high school and then they go and go on American Isle and then all of a sudden they come back and everyone wants to just touch them. As I talked with my kids early on, I'm like, isn't that ridiculous? And they're like, yeah. And I said, they go, are you famous, Dad? And I said, well, in certain subcultures of this world, I'm known. Now, it's not like that, but people have asked for my autograph. So, and and I'm like, that's kind of ridiculous, huh? And they go, yeah. Yeah, that is, Dad. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Right? And it is. Right. Because my name's on a book or because I do a podcast or because whatever you sing well or you kick a ball well or you throw a ball well or whatever, then you're put on this pedestal. Now, I'm not saying you don't have people you look up to and you don't have role models, whatever. But what I love what he said is he said, Rebecca's like, who in the world is this? What are you doing to me? And he and Ted says to him, he says, he's an undiscovered mega talent. And he goes, Rebecca, you don't want to judge a book by the cover on this one. And I think that's something for us to, again, going back to that humility, going back to that humble posture, going back to that learning posture, to be able to say, don't judge a book by its cover, to be able to say, who are you? Enter in, whether it's a homeless person on the street or whether it's the CEO, enter in and get past that facade, get past that, that look. Because if you look at Camp Cole, you're like, he probably smelled, he probably was, you know, he had like dreads, he had this one man band thing, he looked like whatever. But he starts playing and you're like, all right, this guy can do something here. And I imagine, you know, that's the case on the the soccer field too. You can see a kid without shoes coming onto the field. What the heck? Well, it could be Pele, right? And and beyond that. So what do you think of that and how have you seen that play out? Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned Pele. I mean, if you watch that, the movie, one of the Pele movies, that's kind of the way he's kind of played out there is that he's, you know, 
obviously they're the poor kids from Brazil yeah. trying to play the kids that have money yeah. uh, without shoes and they fake, they steal some shoes or right. buy some yeah, shoes they or whatever. They're too big yeah. and they've got them on a yeah. different show, but, but yeah, judge a book by its cover. Then they watch him play like, man, this, this kid's got it, yeah. you know? But yeah, the, I, I don't want to get into names of it, but there, there are players even in the professional ranks of soccer that if they just walk out onto the field and I did not know who they were, I would look at them and go, no way. Yeah that person has got what it takes to play professionally, but watching them play and seeing their talent and their ability is like, man, I, I totally would have missed the boat on that. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of our job is evaluating talent. You have to break through some of those walls sometimes when you walk out to a field and, and maybe somebody doesn't look the part necessarily, yeah. you know, or someone calls you about a player and they're not on the team. So just being open-minded to those things. But I think even through, through leadership, we talked earlier about getting to know what, people's strengths are, what their influence can be, don't count people out because I've, I've seen many players just who've come through my program that, you know, you're trying to figure out what is it that they're, what is their influence going to be? And at one point when it hits, you're like, man, how did I not see that? That is just, they are amazing piece of what we're doing here. And, but I do like your point about just the celebrity piece in, in our world. And, and I think as in some of our talks we've had on clubhouse, just the differences between how football players or professional players and celebrities taken in Europe as it is to the U S some of those conversations have yeah. been very interesting how, you know, our celebrities have bodyguards, our professional players have bodyguards and they, they have hidden meetings that aren't known in public because they can't be, they don't want to be disturbed by fandom basically. Right. And in, in Europe, maybe changing a little bit, but for the most part, kind of like in Ted Lasso, he's sitting in the, he's sitting in the pub, mm -hmm. you know, drinking with the, with the community, things like that. I think we are doing ourselves a disservice by idolizing people the way that we are. The YouTube, uh, you know, there's there's some crazy stat, I don't know the number, but some crazy stat of young people that are aspiring to be YouTubers now. Like that, that is their goal. Oh, is yeah. they, they No longer do we want to be firemen and policemen, we want to be YouTubers. Even in my own household, my kids want to start a YouTube <laughs> yep. channel. I'm like, okay, let's talk through that a little bit, <laughs> you know? So I think it's something definitely to, to step on here. And you see it, you know, name, Im image, and likeness is taking over the college industry. And I can't really talk a lot about that, but what is that going to do for amateur athletics, yep. which is college athletics and the celebrity that's being put into a lot of that? Yeah. My daughter had the dream after her, I'm not going to say what year, but uh, to be the, the new TikTok star. So that was, that was one summer in our home. That was fun to navigate, but, but it, it, exactly to your point. And I think that that is something that we have set up. It's what we've done. It's, it's what our culture what, whether it's social media, other things, you know, now you can just literally, I mean, heck we're on it. We're on podcast. So we can do this podcast and you can do a blog, you can do whatever you can create yourself and paint yourself as the quote unquote expert in something with literally no degree, no experience, no anything. But if you get enough followers, then you are a quote unquote influencer, which, you know, what do we say? Leadership is influence. So then you see yourself as a leader when the fact is, you know, you're just, you're just spouting off stuff. Right. And, and if you get enough followers, then people say, oh, they must know what they're talking about because they have 20,000 followers or 2 million followers or whatever followers. So, again, form over substance is a dangerous thing in a lot of things in life. And if you don't know what I'm talking about that there, then, you know, hopefully we'll get into that later on. But it's the idea of, you know, this judge a book by its cover. Right. Like you don't get in to see what the substance is. We see it in a lot of things that we do. And I just want to really encourage you guys out there to really focus on substance. As you said, you talked about it in recruiting, and that's in jobs as well. Don't just look and go, oh, they were number one in their class, therefore they're a great candidate. They may or may not be. They could be totally unethical. They could have cheated their way to the top. They could have, you know, they could be the person who you have zero interest to work with, right? The same thing with a player. You know, you look and go, oh, they scored 300 goals. Okay, well, who'd they play for? Was it, a, was it, were they playing the, you know, kids who can't play soccer and that is their league? Or were they playing against amazing, you know? And so, again, on paper is just that. It's on paper. That's why they play the game, but it's also why you need to get to know the person. Totally. I think you take Ted's comment, too, about not judging a book by its cover. I think you can twist that and say, Rebecca, don't judge me by my cover. Mm. You know, him walking in there, her setting him up for failure. This guy's a kind of an idiot. He's a, 
you know, American football coach. I'm going to set him up for failure. And in that moment, he's not saying it to her, but I think I kind of read into the, just the, the way the story is being written that you're saying, Hey, don't judge a book by his cover. I'm talking about Cam, the musician, but I'm also talking about me because right. look what we're, look what we're doing here with this yeah. goofy American football coach and his assistant, whose name is Beard. Absolutely. And on that note, I mean, look at Rebecca. Look, I mean, every every character in the yeah. episode or in the show, actually, you look at Rebecca, you look at Jamie, you look at Keely, you look at Roy. I mean, the people who appear to have it all figured out are the ones who have identity issues. Right. Every one of those, except Ted, he's the one that everyone thinks has no clue. And he's the one who gets himself. He's the one who understands. Now, he's going through issues in life, too. And he hits crisis and he hits bottom and he hits all those things in the show. But the other people who appear to have it all together, you know, even the quote that Rebecca says to Keely, you know, talking about the relationship with Jamie's like, what about accountability? And she's just it, it hit her. And she's like, what do you mean? Like, I got to be accountable for something. And Jamie has to be accountable for something. And, you know, and then so as they're figuring out who they are, I mean, that's what again, this this show is brilliant. The writing is brilliant in the show for a lot of reasons. And I think that character development, not just because they're developing the characters, but because the characters are developing. And that's something that I really appreciate about it. And that's if that's something we can take our players, our employees, our kids, our spouses, ourselves on this journey of development and understanding who we are then that is something that I think is a massive win. That is something that I think is much more important than that wins and losses. As you said, you need to get those wins and losses, but I think those wins and losses will come if you help people to understand that and you help the team to understand its team identity too. So last thoughts from you before we wrap it up. Well, you talk about hopefully the wins and losses come, hopefully more wins than losses, yeah. but the losses will come along with that. That's part of part of it. But no, I think just uh, fun conversation today. Just just talking through Ted Lasso and just just you said early on in the show. If you're not a not a fan of Ted La Ted Lasso, I think that if you're not a fa fan of Ted Lasso, you've probably not seen the show. Mm -hmm. So I can encourage those that haven't seen it to to watch it. Uh, I was a doubter, but with peer pressure from family and friends, I watched it, and uh, now I'm a super fan. Uh, not really super fan, I but I am a fan. But I think it's some great lessons, not just for soccer, but life and leadership, which is what we're talking about here. Phil, I appreciate you helping us navigate the waters here, man. It's a blast. Absolutely love doing it. Love doing it with you. Love doing it with everyone out there. Thanks for being a part of this show. Thanks for downloading this episode, other episodes. Again, go back, listen to not only this season, we have 20 something episodes at this point. And I've been blown away by the guests, by the people ever since that first interview I did with some dude at, at Baylor University. This is... You've gone, you've gone so far since then. It's amazing. I knew when we did that, you only, you can only go up from there, brother. So you have done an amazing job doing that. So I set, I set you up pretty well. You can only go up from there. There's no going backwards. Hey, you know, there, it's, there's a leadership lesson in there somewhere. So anyway, but yeah, again, as, as Paul mentioned, we are on Clubhouse. If you're not on Clubhouse and you have an iPhone, hopefully you'll go to Android soon here pretty, pretty soon as well. But if you have an iPhone, get on Clubhouse. If you need an invite, shoot me an email and I can get you one. But uh, get on to Clubhouse. And we every Friday morning, we do a show called How Soccer Explains Leadership, just the title of this podcast. We keep it simple for you. But join us there because then you can ask us questions. We can have, I'd love to dialogue with you. Yep. And so I know Paul would as well. We love those conversations. They're a lot of fun. There's been some pretty amazing people on that as well that uh, have, again, from high school coaches and youth coaches to, to Premier League players and CEOs and chairmen of, of, of clubs and all kinds of people from different walks of life. And that's what makes it great. And so I, I encourage you to, to hop on there too and, and join the conversation up on stage there if you're in, if you're in Clubhouse. 9.30 a.m. Pacific time every Friday morning. We hop onto that and uh, we have a great conversation. So join us there. And uh, again, you know, I, I hope that you're taking everything that you're learning from this show. You're taking what we're talking about here today, Ted Lasso, the different interviews that we're doing, the conversations that Paul and I are having, and you're using it to help you to develop yourself as a leader, you're helping it to understand yourself better, your players better, your families better, the people around you in your lives better, and you are taking all that you're learning to help you understand how soccer really does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great week. <laughs>